Hey there, everybody, and uh, welcome to another episode of the Agile Podcast. This is one of our specials with we calling the Prestigious Pint series. And this episode, we got to speak to another world famous legendary agilist, Sandy Marmalee from New Zealand, the other side of the world. And Sandy's been uh, leading the charge of Agile over in that part of the world for a long time, one of our most respected Agile coaches over there. And we spent a good good hour talking about how her experience from different countries, different cultures has played out in the Agile world, uh, as well as the pandemic, and how things like animals and language play a massive part in culture and teamwork. And she's also an Olympian, a former Olympian. She's represented her country at handball. What a, what a great claim to fame that is. If ever there was a pub, a, a story worthy of a pub, it's that. So we even talked about that as well. So um, we hope you enjoy it. We hope you're subscribed wherever you are in these, uh, these times. It's good to be, always good to be subscribed to a pub, pubcast. Maybe let us know. Maybe tweet us and tell us, where do you listen to, your, to our podcast? Maybe you're in the office. Maybe you're enjoying a coffee or having a sandwich for lunch. Maybe you're out on a run. Are you stravering it? What's your personal best? But uh, we hope you're enjoying it anyway. We hope it, it we hope we hope it gets you to wherever you need to be. Um, but that's enough of us rambling on after a drink. Uh, so let's uh, let's play the jingle. <laughs> There we go, out, back mate. in the virtual pub. Mm. Look at that, proper mahogany bar. Not Lovely, really. isn't it? We can dream. We can, we can. World. We can, but dream of a of a virtual place, of a real oh, place. Kind of, even. It's yeah, a wooden setting. I've got a nice keg of beer here. Do you think Pour one day you, you you could own a bar and work and you know live in a bar? I've always fantasised about it. Mm. Probably be the death of me. My granddad had my granddad used to own a pub. Mm. He, he drank the profits. Yeah, that's the that's the publican's uh, lifestyle, isn't it? I, I one of my best friends' parents ran a pub, and drinking pretty much every night. I think you. I mean, you've got it's rude not to, isn't it? If you're the landlord or landlady, mm. drinking with the lo- your regulars. That's it. A bit fun there. A so, until someone loses an eye. Exactly, yeah, that's the same. I've got, um, I've got my. I'm still drinking Christmas cider, Jeff. I'm still drinking Christmas Orchard, cider. Orchard Pig. Oh, you, you haven't got through that yet. Though. One of my damaged cans. Did I? Did I tell the story <laughs> yeah. about about you my? You told uh, me about it. I don't know whether you told the podcast. Yeah, probably shouldn't in case Orchard Pig end up sponsoring this. But Orchard Pig sent me twelve cans of pink cider. Which turned up damaged, so I did the good thing and used Twitter to my advantage and uh, you gave got them in some touch. Feedback. Gave them some feedback. They were very apologetic. Sent twelve more. They turned up still damaged. <laughs> Ended up with twenty-four cans of uh, pink cider. Did the good thing. Tweet, tweeted them. They were very apologetic. Sent twelve more. They were okay, but I still then had thirty-six cans of pink cider to drink. The side is not pink, right? It's just the can that's pink. No, the side is pink. Let me show you. How is it? Yeah, it's it's um, blush cider. Can you see that? Hold it in no. front of me. There we go. Okay, yeah. So it's it's um, like a rosé. Like a rosé cider. So I assume it's just yeah, red apples. It's nice. It's it's like very sweet. Very sweet indeed. Hmm. Well, I'm drinking something very cool for me. Anyway, I think it's cool. You probably wouldn't. Cool but as I've in hip. Mini... As in trendy. Yeah, but it's also cold. I'm wiping the condensation. I've got a mini keg, a five litre mini keg mm. from the Wild Beer Company, who we've done a pubcast from a Wild Beer Company venue, but it is no more. Yes, it's it's the premises it's shut down because uh, I guess, I, I think it shut down before COVID actually, the, the actual place in Cheltenham. They oh, have okay. other bars, but they're, they're still going well online. Um, so yeah, I've got this shipped, shipped out to me, a mini keg. Um, and this is one of their IPAs 
called Misadventure. I'll give me a cool little disc, let's see. You know, if you go into a bar, you could put that over there. Oh, so you could, if you had like a, what do they call it? A little pump. pump. Yeah, you yeah. could put it on the pump. It's quite cool. So, um, yeah, it's six and a half percent, and it's, it smells very fruity. Mm. And it's got a little shot. I've got the. I've got it in a wild beer glass as well. That drink wildly differently. It's pretty. Cool so they glass. sent the, the glass with the keg, did they? No, I already had a glass, but I did get another glass. There's a, there's a, there's another story behind this in that I'm going to a tasting session tomorrow for another of their new release beers, where they send out some. You can buy the beer. It's a, it's just released, and they'll also send you a packet of the hops, and you know, they'll they'll teach you how to you know, scent, um, smell the hops and things. And other people who like the beers are just going to be online at the same time and going to have a tasting session with complete strangers on a Friday night. This is Interesting. my life. <laughs> but yeah, this Ross. one is... Uh, sorry, I didn't give you any tasting notes, did I? Hold no. On. See, it's quite... Um, it's sharp but not sour. Um, sort of feeling on the front and the middle of your tongue rather than the back. It's nice. Mm. Um, it's a bit, I'll say a little bit more grapefruity than... Uh, grapefruit is a citrus fruit, but not 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 like a lemon or an orange or anything. A bit, a bit more of a grapefruit, sour grapefruity taste, maybe. Mm. Mm, I like it. I'm impressed. So, your yeah. your um your tasting notes are so much more uh, thorough than mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have That's slightly it. more complex drinks to drink than you do. Well, well, this is true. I'm a very simple man, Jeff. So yeah, just just uh, keep it simple. Very good. How was your day? How's my day? Um, it was kind of almost a day off actually because um, it was my son's birthday today. So we we were playing with Peppa Pigs and Thomas the Tank Engines and whatever he wanted to do. Basically, he was two okay. today, so we were. Um, yeah, there was no no work he's not, going on. It. Hang on a minute, he's not two years old today. I know, I know. Two. Mm. Oh my days. I know people say that a lot when they hear kids ages. They go, oh, he's, oh he's, he's growing up so fast. But my God, he was only and born more than half of his life. He's been in lockdown. That's crazy, isn't it? Poor little boy. <laughs> he doesn't realise it. But well, do you think he does realise it? Do you think he knows? Do you think he knows things are different or? or no, things I don't are, think so. Is his, is his normal different to what ours, you know, definitely what it used to be like. But then my normal is different to my parents' normal. Yeah, I suppose. There you go. Two years old, eh? Mm-hmm. Well, happy birthday. I'll, I'll drink to him. <laughs> if you can drink to a two-year-old. Yeah, cheers, old. Grayson. <laughs> cheers, buddy. Well, you always used to say, wet the baby's head, didn't you? And mm. It's a sort of tradition when a baby's born, you go out and get drunk. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the excuse is you're wetting the baby's head. I'm not quite sure where that, that tradition comes from. But I used to, I'll, confession, I used to think it actually meant, literally, you wet your baby's head. Like, you like a pour, baptism. Yeah, like you pour water on him. Or her. Mm. Poor beer. Mm. Get the baby drunk. Don't anyway. try that at home, kids. No, we're not condoning. So this that. is another. Of our, yeah, let's get let's get to work. So this is another of our prestigious pints. Um, yes. Recaps. Yes. And um, yeah, we we got to chat to. So this is the beauty of distributed stuff. Yeah. Where things have changed over the last twenty years, we wouldn't have been able to have this kind of conversation in real time with someone in New Zealand mm-hmm. 15, 20 years ago we could barely speak to someone in London very true but um, yeah we we, we ca- caught up with Sandy Marmoli I've always called her Sandy Marmoli but apparently it's Marmoli <laughs> I'm pretty sure so I pronounced her name wrong <laughs> yeah, yeah so, so yeah, Sandy's someone com- I, I yeah go, go on. on no she was she was coming live at the time from literally the other side of the world wasn't she mm, literally the yeah other, or, Auckland sunny Auckland New Zealand sunny not locked down Auckland so no. not only are they not locked down they've got gorgeous weather in many respects it was painful for her to tell us it was how normal things were lovely mm. <laughs> shame there we go but I, I yeah I don't I don't begrudge them it if uh, yeah they've why not? Good, good, good for them. Good for mm. them. Mm. <laughs> not jealous at all. <laughs> but what but, were you going to um, say? You're going to say where where you knew her from? 
<laughs> yeah, well, it was one of those where we've known each other for a long time, but we couldn't really, we've never actually physically met. Hmm. I mean, even before the pandemic, we the, all of our sort of engagements have been remote anyway. So we were on virtual teams uh, on things like conference tracks, um, yeah. things like that. So you and never actually met at any of the conferences then? I don't think so. But that's not to say that we haven't. It's <laughs> and you've just, just forgotten. Well, and, and Sandy, to be honest, because I think we're the kind of people that if we had met, we'd probably been drunk anyway, having a natter <laughs> by that time of the night. Yeah. Um, but no, I don't think we have met up. Uh, in the same, although we would probably have been at the same conferences at times. Mm-hmm. So no, it was good to, and she's someone that, for as long as I can remember, I've always, um, what's the word? I, I, I've recommended her to people. Yeah. Um, yeah. For, for for if anybody's wanted work in that part of the world, and many a time, uh, people have said Australia, and I said, yeah, Sandy's just down the road. <laughs> um, <laughs> before I'm told that that's like ten hours away, Jack. Yeah, it's quite. A, it's a dece- I think it's like six hours. It's a long way. It's a long. It's long just flight. like England and Wales to me. Exactly. Just jump in the car. It's like going, going going from London to Dublin. It's that's what it is, really. But commute. You, know. you can probably commute from. From <laughs> Melbourne to Auckland, I imagine. You can commute. But yeah, she's a good egg. She's a good yeah. egg. And uh, yeah, she's been she's been pushing that uh pushing that rock uphill in in Antipodea for for quite a while. And not just mm. there, it turns out. She's she's been around the the world. Yeah, well travelled. She's um I think so she certainly mentioned that she started in Denmark. Well there's there's some kind of history yeah. in Denmark. Mm-hmm. Um but then and she mentioned a few other countries, Scandinavia, Austria, various mm-hmm. different places. So, yeah, I think she's um, she's certainly, and that came up quite a lot on during the, the chat. So it'd be nice to just, we should probably go through some of the the highlights. And we, what we normally do with these is uh, share some of our the highlights and, and play a couple of clips. We've got some clips here to play. The, <laughs> I mean, the, fir- <coughs> the first thing that I was keen to so we started off as, as you do with any normal conversation really it's a bit of small talk isn't it how are you, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm, lockdown's mm-hmm. horrible here but you're having a lovely time we hate you but we love you that kind of thing <laughs> um and it just naturally evolved into the the, the conversation and the first thing that, that, that sprang up for me was well culturally you've seen lots of different things and you know culturally new zealand is very very different to other places is that is that similar from an agile perspective having that sort of uh, you and i've never lived in any other country right we're just mm-hmm. born in the uk lived in the uk so she's got that experience um and it was interesting to hear her views on the sort of relative nature of of country culture mm-hmm. let's play the clip i think my original work culture is danish and um if you take that as a baseline then um New Zealand is quite hierarchical, and I know that it's not compared to other countries, but compared to Scandinavia, it is. So we, you and I would typically think of, let's say, the Dutch as being very direct. Yeah. But the Dutch probably aren't very direct if you compare them to another type of culture. Mm-hmm. And it's all, it, I think that that's probably something I've been guilty of in the past, and that's where stereotypes come in in a way, I suppose, isn't it? But um, having that exposure culturally i think is really really useful to have in, a, in an agile coach's toolkit we're well, just knowing yeah i agree and just knowing how people's responses could be different and i think it just gives you more awareness of how people may react differently and almost you, know, you it wouldn't surprise you as much and this this came up on a um i was doing a, a class today and it came up we were talking about body language and how even sometimes body language, whilst human body language, parts of it is quite universal, but culturally body language can be quite different. And so that's mm. um, being aware of that and certainly tuned into that and having, you know, having those experiences behind you, I think is going to make not just agile coaches, but any type of people role. It's going to make that a better experience. Well, especially if your if your team is going to be a lot more globally diverse, right? There's the understanding cultural differences and interpretations and and she was telling us about how 
language is the same words mean very different things no or that's to achieve the same outcome you would say a different thing yeah let's play that clip there's a clip of that that goes down to like everyday language where um i translate mm. i i speak to a friend in austria or denmark and i tell them hey um i want to leave see ya if i do this in new zealand i go i'll let you go it means the same thing but you say it in a very different yeah. way i'll let you go versus i want to leave and while i'm not necessarily um I, I, so my my first instinct there is as well as that being very very interesting just from an anthropological point of view is when mapping that to an agile perspective when i'm talking about um well i don't necessarily talk so much about agile to leadership anymore it's more it's almost leadership are talking to me about agile and i'm kind of saying to them well hold on a minute before you go too far is that what you mean mm. and, and th that's 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 a whole kind of words maybe we'll come back to in a minute um so where am i going with this i'm thinking well I can experience, so we've experienced a really, we've experienced BT. Yeah. Yeah. And BT had a culture. Yeah. And until we'd experienced anything else, that's all we had. So we were comparing BT's culture to, you know, what we were hearing from scrum trainers or we were hearing uh, or reading about in the new, new product development game or whatever. And then we got to experience other different kinds of cultures and we were comparing BT then to me, the, an investment bank or a mm -hmm. pharmaceutical company or a publishing company. or, And that's that's all within the UK. So we've still got the UK culture, but even then you've got different industries and different companies and domains within there that have different cultures. And being able to say, well, I've been in this situation and that felt really command and control at the time but now I'm here it obviously wasn't or yeah. the other way around you know you yeah. can appreciate the, the spectrum more and I think that's quite helpful and even so I've had I won't name clients and and whatever but I've had industries or courses within certain industries that I thought I knew I suppose I'd made an assumption that the culture would be similar they're mm. still they're still inherently software companies but it's a different industry so it's the video games industry which mm -hmm. i always assumed would be a similar thing but i think in many respects it, it's not it's a much more creative culture and it's a much more appears to be a much more hierarchical one um and that surprised me it caught me out um and it just it reminds me again as well so i, I did a course this week um and one of the uh, att attendees on it was um from chile Okay. And she was, um, she was. Her first language was was Spanish, I believe. I think. Mm. So, um, and she was asking me. She was um, getting a little bit mixed up with the, uh, the some of the Scrum terms, and this is where I think the Scrum terms have kind of helped because the idea is that with a, with a vocabulary like like the Scrum framework, we should all at least if even if we disagree culturally, we should be able to agree what part of that framework is. Yeah. Um, and she was looking. She was trying to virtually like translate, and she was like, so. Luckily, there is a, a Spanish version of the um, of the Scrum Guide, and we were we were looking up some of the terms and whether they'd be the same terms in uh, English as they were in Spanish. But apparently, they're not. Okay. I thought they would be, but they're not. Do you know what product backlog is in Spanish, Jeff? Have a, have a guess. <laughs> what, what, what what would you say? Well, I, I I should be able to tell you this because my Scrum Mastery is currently being translated into Spanish. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, no, I can't. Off the top of my head, offhand, I can't tell you what product backlog is in Spanish. I think it was from memory. It was pila di prodotto, right? Which, which oh, sounds. I like something. the accent. Hmm. Yeah, but um, so she was, and I, I said that to her. I looked it up during a break. I, I said that to her, and she went, "Oh, she laughed," and it basically means pile of product. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and in some places I've worked, it is a pile of product. But she said, literally, that literal translation is like a laundry. It would be a laundry pile. That's what she refers to. It. Okay. That's a, a pila. So a laundry pile. So um, it's interesting how even even the the literal the, the the translation of some of the terms doesn't yeah. necessarily equate to the same understanding. I thought that was quite interesting. No, I have. Yeah, it is interesting, and I, I've. So I've had my books translated into German and now Spanish and, and, and 
Italian to come and things. And, and I, I don't speak any of them, so I, I'm completely oblivious as to whether what they've <laughs> written is any good. Yeah. So the only way that I can do that is is by basically testing it with speakers. And interestingly, I've got... Um, so you say about Chile. So the, the people that are doing my Spanish translation, I've got one who's in uh, Ecuador mm -hmm. and one who is in... Uh, actually, um, Germany, but is um, from continental Spain. And South American Spanish and, um, I guess, Spanish Spanish uh, are, are quite different in many ways. So you've got lots of sort of informalities and, and nuances that by working together, they've managed to come up with something that works. And, yeah, they said, Jeff, Jeff there actually isn't a translation for what you've got here. Oh, really? And I said, okay, so... <laughs> what, what do you suggest? I can't. <laughs> I can't make a decision here yeah. as a product owner. I can't make a decision. It's obviously you're the people who would be reading this book, so write what you would want to read. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was good. Um, yeah. um, one of the other things that I talk about culture was we we slightly had it. We hit um, a lovely pivot. Um, what happened during the chat was we Sandy had to. Um, move or relocate her. Uh, oh yeah, her um, her laptop where she was uh, speaking to us because the the connection wasn't great. Um, and she said she was worried that the dog might bark. And that that mm. just that little hook there, that little offer, um, led us down a path on um, on pets. Mm. Um, and she was um, she she told us about her dog, and we were t started talking about dogs. And so it got onto a conversation around how you you made a link between how maybe are the, our pets and culture in in some way linked. And that I thought that was an mm. interesting conversation. Let's play the clip on that one. I wouldn't see dogs in the office in Austria, um, no. maybe in a startup, but. Um, I'd really I'd sometimes see them in New Zealand. That's uh, of smaller companies could have dogs in the office, and uh, I see lots of animals on uh, on Zoom calls. We we talked about yeah whether you, we see um we I see a lot of we see a lot of um into people's homes on Zoom calls now and and remote w uh, working. So you are seeing more of people's home life, more pets. Certainly seeing a lot more pets wandering across the. Uh, the screen and more people who are willing to um, ask and share and say, "Can can you can you put your dog in front of the camera? Can we see your dog?" There was. Um... I think we're, get, we're getting a democratization. Probably isn't the right word, um, but the only other word that came to mind was dilution. I didn't like that either. But almost a democratization of cultures in a way because mm. of this working from home. In the, mm. so, my point was around the dogs thing. I've, I've worked in offices in the UK where dogs have just been wandering around the office and the dog is a very part of the British culture um, but you wouldn't get you wouldn't really get that in other countries and we were talking about certain countries that wouldn't do that but mm. now you're seeing someone in the UK that has a dog it's normal it's just here or someone who cats sitting on the keyboard and typing yeah, yeah, yeah. and another country or someone who's in another country where that wouldn't be normal they're seeing that as normal and it's accepted and mm -hmm. it sort of might just bleed into that culture if you like and mm. that morphing that meshing of, of cultures is coming through maybe, mm. maybe yeah definitely a bonus. and uh, but i think it's um i think it's given what i've noticed from the the calls that i've had very recently it's it's a um an opportunity for small talk it's uh mm. and this is the thing that we talked about this a lot before that people are finding it harder and harder because the small talk is slowly ebbing away from their meetings and their their team working and i spoke to a coach today who's um who's struggling with that with that remoteness and she's uh, unfortunately she's only 12 months into her role and only spent three months of a 12 month role actually in the office mm -hmm. so and sandy spoke about this about the uh, the difficulty um that it is of of trying to coach and build relationships whilst work, being an agile coach whilst working from home I think we've got a clip on that yeah. somewhere working from home is harder I think especially as an agile coach where you actually get to observe people you get to overhear conversations and mm. where um, it's all about I find it hard to build relationships because everything has to be a meeting and that must that must be we're all people people but especially when your role is about building relationships. 
Is it possible? Well, I mean, can you can you do it? I mean, it, you... it is possible, and, and it's something that I don't know how much you've done, but I know. I mean, I was coaching remotely before the pandemic because I've had people, I've had clients all around the world anyway. It is harder to start a relationship, but do you feel it's... you would have made further leaps, or maybe the client may have made further leaps if you'd have been in the same room together? Yeah, I would say so. Mm. But then it's it's a similar. So I I was asked in the past. Well, you, you you would have been as well many many times, and I'm sure we have spoken about this before, about um, <clears throat> distributed agile, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, we were in the past. Can can scrums can scrum work distributed? So well, yeah yeah, of course it can, but um, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a good thing. But equally, it doesn't necessarily mean that it can't work. But given given the choice we would be co-located but if we can't be co-located then agile gives us the best chance of mitigating that that, that kind of um, extra risk and extra uh, inefficiencies and, and and effectiveness that we get um and i've lost my thread sorry don't worry but i had an interesting conversation just today about this and i think this perhaps dawned on me while i was having the conversation with another coach about this today about how much I think coaching remotely, for me, maybe 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 this is an assumption, I'll test this with you. Has coaching remotely become more of a push? So I'm talking now from the perspective of an internal coach. So you, rather than you, you're, you're not an internal coach, you're an external coach, right? So, no, so say yeah. you are, you're with, embedded within an organization and you are there, your mm -hmm. duty is to, to help mm -hmm. and would you find this this um, this client I was talking to this certainly has found that it's it's harder to she doesn't have many people coming to to see her or, or it's harder just to tap on the shoulder or meet over a coffee and so all of a sudden yeah. the conversation starts it's much more deliberate it's much more of a push she's having to go to people and coach to them rather than having people coming or teams coming to her well it's an interesting way of looking at it and Sandy used the phrase, it's difficult because everything is a meeting. Now, mm. you know, I spent a long time, my, my, my most recent client, I spent a long time there. And it was, even in the office, it was still mostly meetings. So we had regular one-to-one -one sessions and we had regular team coaching sessions. But they were always booked in advance. Even when I was physically there it wasn't a case of oh just bump into them in the corridor let's go and no. have a chat it was always scheduled i mean these people had incredibly busy calendars um, as members of the leadership team um so the only chance of a kind of informal thing would have been trying to, trying to grab a point after work that that would have been the only chance for that yeah and I, I, I don't necessarily yeah. think that's a bad thing so i i get the whole conversation corridor thing I get the whole picking things up as, as you're just observing things absolutely but that wasn't my that wasn't how I was working before the pandemic anyway but I wonder if that's more leadership coaching whether that is a bit more formal I'm, I'm wondering whether team-based or like one-to-one -one developer based coaching is is a bit more that's a fair point a bit less that's formal. a fair point but I, I know so something that we've we've almost blown people's minds with you and I on one of our more advanced training courses is around this idea of contracting. Mm -hmm. So talking to scrum masters, talking to coaches, product owners, leaders, managers, whoever about just having a conversation about, you know, what do you expect of one another? What, what is our almost terms of engagement here? You know, and having that in place, well, should we have this informal thing? Should we have an informal thing? Mm. Um, and, that I think is a really important conversation to have, even more so now. Uh, well, maybe, maybe maybe it's less important now because actually you don't really have as much of a choice. But where I was, I, I just remember where I was going before this <laughs> idea of you know, if if you could be if you could be together, do it. But if you can't, then make the best of it. And it's it's a sense to me of well, I, if it's a choice between having the right coach but in the wrong place, mm. or the wrong coach in the right place. I'd rather have the right coach in the wrong place. Um, and the right coach 
who doesn't have optimum circumstances is going to do a lot more good than the wrong coach in the optimum circumstances is my view mm, yeah i can see i can see the logic there okay i think it's um and i'm gonna um pay uh, a little tribute to our good friend <laughs> having a wee jeff <laughs> <laughs> So if, I'll week. leave. Uh, maybe I won't edit that out. But Jeff hasn't gone to the toilet in in the uh, against, against the just bar pouring. in the pub. He's just pouring himself pouring another drink. drink. I'll, I'll just make a note of the time on that one. Um, <laughs> no, uh, no, but where was it? our good friend and um, product owner of the Scrum Alliance, Howard Howard Sublet? So this is mm. something I remember Howard doing right, and this may have been to do with the start of the pandemic back back in March last year. And the Scrum Alliance, you know, made some announcements about how things were going to change, and very you know, obviously we're all myself, yourself, are involved from that point of view. But Howard um, made himself available, and something he did, and he put times in his diary, was saying, "I'm going to be on on this call, and if you want yep. to come and join me, um, if, even if you just want to chat, you want to just have a coffee, just mm -hmm. stop by and." it's my virtual office door and basically he was opening his his virtual office door for because of the time zone difference as well he was dealing with guides and, and trainers all over the world he was um he set it up at various times throughout his day or a couple of times yeah. on different time zones so and i think that was a nice touch that was a way of of this pull meant this this pull coaching so if if you need help if you need support here i am i'm here mm -hmm. I'm, and yeah. it's, diff it's difficult for me to put that on you but if you need it um, I'm always here for you which is which, and it's a nice thing to do and I think maybe some of that has been lost in the um, in the 12, 10 12 months of mayhem since then um, not just in the Scrum Alliance but probably in many many other companies because meetings have become the the timetable I think now has become the priority um, mm -hmm. because it's the only way and like Sandy says everything has become a bit of a meeting I would agree with that statement yeah it doesn't have to be a bad thing I don't know maybe maybe that's just a mindset thing but hmm I mean the other thing that that I thought was really interesting from Sandy's perspective and it's something that you know again I don't really have you kind of have an idea you've been to New Zealand I haven't even been there um but you just just you get the impression that it's on a smaller scale mm. I mean, there are a lot fewer people there, even than the UK, right? So it is it is a smaller scale. But we were talking about scaling, um, and she she had, she had a, a quite a, a funny little comment about that. Yeah, let's play that one. There's this funny thing about New Zealanders. We know, um, like, sometimes I go to companies and they say, "Well, we need to scale, and we want to do safe." And I go, "Okay, so how many teams do you have?" And they go, "Well, three. So there's a lot of um, companies thinking they're big because they're big by New Zealand standards. <laughs> and it, made, it did make me chuckle that you think that's scaling. That's not scaling at all. It's like that kind of... <laughs> have you seen Crocodile Dundee, Jeff? Have you seen that film? Mm, I, I know, I know, the, I know the line you're going to you quote. Know, you call you that a knife. knife. I, know, I know that. That's not a knife. But I don't that's, think I've... That's a knife. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, it's, and <laughs> you want to scale? Three? How, how many teams? Three teams. Oh, that's not really scaling then. Yeah, and um, wanting to be part of the whole agile movement and wanting to try these new frameworks when in, in, in reality, that's probably over, over egging the pudding, if that's still a phrase. Mm. Yeah, it was interesting. And that, that yeah, I, very, I can believe that from having been to New Zealand. And you go to New Zealand and you would drive for... Just to give you an idea of the population, the, di the difference in population density, this the sheer number of people is radically different. So I More sheep than people, I heard. Yeah, there are more sheep than people. I don't know if that's an urban myth or whether that's actually true, but um, yeah, you would drive on a road in South Island of New, Ze uh, New Zealand and you wouldn't see another car for two hours. It would be that, and that's typical. Um, and I can imagine a lot of companies, uh, not, not to their detriment, but just because there's probably less less people less jobs smaller companies i mean they're still they're doing big biz big business but um i imagine they're just doing it uh with some, with less people hmm. that's not always a bad thing less less is more is many in many respects well that's it isn't it and i think that's 
Uh, that's something that I'm I'm having quite a few conversations about. Uh, I sort of started opening that can of worms earlier on, which is that so in the in the in the context of the whole twenty years of of agile since the agile manifesto and so on, you know, now I'm not getting companies. I'm not getting leaders saying, uh, "Talk to me." About how to get better what's this agile thing that everyone's talking about people leaders that are asking for agile now that they, 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 they know the buzzwords mm -hmm. they know that agile is probably something they need to be thinking if, even, even if they don't know the details so it's not about me coming to them and saying have you heard about this thing called agile no no they have mm. but actually is agile what they want or need is is the other question and and so what you know, we had a bit of a conversation about with Sandy is that it's not about creating an agile organization per se it's about creating a coherent organization a, re a resilient organization and you know New Zealand has that we talked about that, that that resilience being part of a New Zealand culture and how you know, they, they are very they have a lot of bounce back ability mm. don't they as a as a nation would you say let's play that clip yeah let's play the clip because it's a good one I think so. Um, probably, I think what was different was that this felt more um, like it was it was affecting everyone. Mm. Whereas um, earthquakes, some people were a lot more affected than others. Like mm. In Auckland, I wasn't affected by an earthquake in Christchurch that much, but this felt like we had this messaging of uh, like a team of five million, and there was social cohesion uh, that I think helped with that resilience and she she raised an interesting point that um i know i hadn't looked at it like this until she's flipped it around and said maybe that could be a bad thing um mm -hmm. the fact that they haven't they haven't experienced um the the severity i suppose of the lockdowns and of the the uh the resilience that might not have been built up because they haven't had it quite so tough so i think that's a that's an interesting point is that sometimes the 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 harder or the more the, the stress the more stressful the, the you're under the the more you build that resilience or to, to fight back harder yeah i, I agree and that that was that was something that I, I perhaps perhaps i was a little bit too zealous about a while you know 10 15 years ago maybe i don't know this idea that actually you need to feel pain yeah to to need change so my first big um it was at the time it was i, I was going to i was hesitating before saying the word transformation because it's not something that i encourage now but at the time it, that's what it was it was it was mm -hmm. an agile transformation it was an investment bank um and for many reasons in many ways they did need to be more agile but they were still in incredibly profitable <laughs> incredibly profitable so they didn't yeah in from a short to medium term perspective they were seeing why do we need to change what we're doing mm. is making us money we don't we don't need to do anything differently mm. and that's what um you know dave snowden would call the apex predator theory you optimize the current conditions right and and then you become the most fragile to change because you aren't resilient anymore you are you are so efficient at doing one thing the the right way and so blinkered to everything else that's going on around you that you haven't got any kind of disaster recovery plan in place you haven't got any alternative ways of working you haven't got any flexibility and so you become extinct the kodak moment mm. yeah no i agree um on a slight aside i'm sorry mate that's right why are you apologizing? Don't know. That's just uh, just having worked with you for a long time. That that was a uh, that was Paul's way of saying. And moving on, Jeff. <laughs> no, yeah, it was, it, and I have to apologize because I was um, distracted because I was distracted by something someone else has said to me this week. And then you know when when I was something again, just too many things going on in my head. I wasn't yeah. um, active listening, and I apologize for that. Yeah, I was purely cosmetically listening. Bad Paul. But I wanted to run this past you. So this came up this week um, and we were talking about it's it is linked, but it's slightly different. 
um, we were talking about how organizations um, have responded to the pandemic. Okay. Yep. So, and we, I, we were talking on, on the course that I was with, with a few students this week about how some teams have, or some organizations have completely um, reacted and keeping their agile principles and say, okay, this COVID, this COVID shit's happened. We need to reorganize, work from home, laptops, VPNs, make it happen. Okay, so self-organize. Yeah. Um, and um, but other companies have re revert, kind of regressed slightly and gone back to slightly more command and control. Okay, mm. we need to take control of the situation. That that came up, which we've talked about before. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Something called the parasite stress theory came up. Have you heard about that? I'm going to say no. Okay. And I, 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 I was at the time I said no as well because <laughs> I didn't. It's someone clearly a lot more clever than I but, am. Um, should, shall I guess? Go on. Can then. I guess? Yeah, come on. So the more stressed you are, the more uh, susceptible you are to parasites. Possibly, yeah. But she, okay. um, the 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 lady on the on the call was talking about it in terms of the way that I think it's a, um, an experiment or a social uh, society theory that the way that your um, organisations will react. Mm. is 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 correlates to how uh, the number of pandemics um or epidemics sorry that your country has, has experienced okay. so if you're um for instance in europe who mm. have reacted who have had to, um succumbed to a lot of um disaster recovery and and epidemics and and um put those kind of moments have where we? the gut well in, you, apparently in europe yes um, the, where the government steps in and basically takes control of the situation. That, okay. her theory was that that transcends into, so for instance, UK companies who would tend to react in the same way. Mm. Countries that have experienced less of those issues would tend not to suffer from it. It's something called, she said it's something called parasite stress theory. I just thought it was interesting. I, I wondered if you'd come across it before, that theory before, that your, uh, your company reacts based on your country and, and and how many uh epidemics your government has experienced you're now googling it aren't you i can tell oh yeah yeah so the rise of authoritarianism parasites and diseases encountered by species shape the development differences is what leads to differences in biological mate value mm, it was a bit okay. too clever it was a bit too clever for, for paul i'll be honest with you um i was kind of blinded by it but yeah it was um fluctuating asymmetry it was an interesting, interesting. example hmm. well so, while you were talking there so i would because i don't i don't that um term didn't resonate with me so i was mm. thinking perhaps at an unconscious level but perhaps even quite consciously i was to sort of try and think, well, okay, does this link to anything that I've already got a frame of reference to? Um, and to my shame, I can't remember something that I really should be able to remember, which is the what the what the law is called. Um, but there is a, there is a law around you know, you, basically the, the your organisational culture and your organisational structure is in indem definitely linked. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Yes, um, and I think there's you've got to play into the fact that yeah, your your your, your societal culture mm. is linked as well, and also uh, to a degree, you know how I react as a leader is going to mm. be determined a lot on how I how I grew up and the people that I looked to and respected how they yeah. acted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can believe it absolutely. And if if you are if you're conforming to what a higher power the, the government are saying then it is going to have an impact on how you address the same issue within your organization or within your company, surely. Mm. So Sandy was, she was saying how she was quite, she's a very strong personality and I think that's something that's really stood her in good stead um, in terms of being counterculture um, and that sense of uh, being able to say, do you know what? Even if you guys aren't going to come along with me on this, I'm not going along with the norm because mm -hmm. that doesn't sit well with me. And that's something that I really, really took a long time to get comfortable with. Mm. That sense of if 
if you don't want to do this, that's all right, because I'm all right with that. Mm. And I, I spent a long time. I remember doing a doing a talk at, <clears throat> I think it might have been your gathering in London. Okay, 2018. Where, yeah. where somebody asked me a question, or they said, "What's the difference? You've been doing this for a while. How have you changed?" And I said, "To be honest, the the, the main reason, the main way I've changed is I don't care as much." Mm -hmm. And, and I think they meant I didn't have as much passion, but that's not what I meant. It's just I was I was a little bit more I was a little bit less zealous. Mm. I, I, I'm just more comfortable with how how things turn. It doesn't have to be my way. You no. know, I think that's what I'm trying to say. And Sandy seemed to be quite. She had that a lot earlier than I did, and she seems a lot calmer for it. Mm. Did you, you get that? Well, yeah, but it, that's I did absolutely. She's very chilled out, very very laid back. Um, but you would think, especially with a big step like moving from Europe to New Zealand, that that would, if anything, I think for me, that would probably put more stress on me to to make. To, I suppose to justify to myself that I've made the right decision. If if, if people don't want to do this stuff, maybe. Maybe I, the whole decision was a bad one from my perspective. So I think incredible um, kind of confidence and and um, and yeah, laid back approach to yeah, taking that and rolling with the punches uh, very mm. much so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think we need another conversation with her because you hinted at it. You're, you alluded to it earlier on in that uh, the network wasn't great, and that is that's one thing that sort of keeps me going because New Zealand's got so much going for it but it hasn't got great internet going for it <laughs> um, and we, if we'd have had a better connection I think we would have stayed a little bit longer and the one mm. thing I would have asked her would have been about um, so some of our listeners have probably read her book around self-selection and this effectively a case study of basically saying to 200 people organise yourselves mm. um, and how she was quite scared when she did that but it worked out well and coming back to something that you said earlier on when came around coaching remotely how important was it that they were oh, together yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 you know could you imagine doing that remotely where no. you hadn't actually worked <laughs> together and everybody was in their own home maybe this is just me being you know, just silly maybe maybe i'm over skeptical about I think that, it, I, know, but. I think it's very possible I think and she she alluded to this now that I think coming out of this everyone's a lot more um, proficient with tooling and and the mm -hmm. remote element to their work so you know um, people if we need to have a call one of us will just start up a zoom or a teams you know it's at the touch of a button these days but um, <laughs> But it'll happen relatively quickly, and people are, are becoming a lot more um, comfortable with that. But yeah, that two hundred people, and then I was speaking to one of our um, former um, students today, Alistair. Um, Alistair Hughes. Oh, yeah. Alistair. yeah, he won't. He'll get him. He says he listens to the podcast. So I'm sure he's a, he'll be listening to this. Um, and he's um, he was saying <laughs> one of his meetings. Um, asked him how it went today and he said oh it was awful and he said <laughs> he said he said only way i can really describe that paul is the word shit show and that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's how he described it but um i think and that's a large scale planning event and um it's always going to be harder and it's always going to be more scary if you can't if you yeah it's having to the planning that you that must have to go into that kind of large scale meeting online must be incredible. Must be uh, extremely stressful. Mm. I mean, it's it's stressful when you're doing it in person for different reasons, but relying on technology to to get you through it. And we've <laughs> yeah, we've had our fair share of technology letting us down over the last um, ten months or so. But um, over the last twenty four hours, <laughs> yeah, we were sp <laughs> we were supposed to have a call last night and I cancelled it and that's my fault. But um, yeah, it's um, yeah, just trying to get cameras working. But yeah, we're, we're quite lucky we don't have to do it on a big scale. But it must be must be scary. And fair play to them. But yeah. Yes. No, Sandy's um, 
she's a she's a good egg and she's been she's been doing a lot of good for a large community even even though the numbers of people are, are low lower than the uk it's it's a wide area and, and mm -hmm. there's a it's a she we, we call this series the prestigious points because the people that we're speaking to have had a had a huge impact and there's no denying the impact that she's had in that part of the world and mm -hmm. and beyond and uh if you're interested in hearing the full the full interview where you'll hear about how she was uh, not just a an awesome agile coach but also a famous olympian yes represented her country at the olympic games um and and other things that uh and then a little bit more about her dog um, and, and all sorts then uh, then get on over to the patreon website patreon.com slash the agile podcast time everybody come on drink up time ding, to ding, go ding. thank you right we're we done we are say goodbye cheers goodbye cheers